Well, hello, hello, hello to all of my friends. It's about four o'clock here on a Monday, and uh, I have a word that I received from the Lord that I want to share with you. And uh, if you don't get to watch this live, it's okay. It was unscheduled per se, and well, until about 30 minutes prior to. But I was walking through the house, and the Lord spoke this word very clearly to me, and it's there on the bottom right of your screen and and he simply said when gray disappears now that didn't come random out of the out of the blue but i was thinking about some of the things that i had shared and uh i had shared uh, on resurrection sunday yesterday I thought about some of those things and i was going through them in my mind and that's what i heard the lord say when gray disappears so I want to share with you some thoughts today from the word when gray disappears, but I want to first take you back to uh, just part of the clip that I shared yesterday and uh, let this be a lead in because what I didn't say is what I'm about to say now. And oh, by the way, thank you for all of those who tell me to not get in a hurry. So I'm not going to get in a hurry. I'll not be in a hurry. I'll not be in a hurry i'll not be in a hurry anymore i know i took that tune from something else but anyway it works so here's what i said yesterday take a listen everything that's going on right now this is not this should be no surprise matter of fact i've been talking about some of the things i didn't understand everything that i was saying but i've been saying to us that things are coming, things are being shaken, and boy, are they being shaken. I've heard people say, you think it's going to go back to the way it was, and the way it what used to be normally? Well, no. In fact, I hope that it doesn't for the most part, because that's the very thing that the Lord's wanting us to understand about this 2020 resurrection, this 2020 reversal, is to take us back to a place where we once was, where we lost what we once had. All right, so I want to take off from that, and it's good to see you. Hello, Joanna. Hello, Debbie Poplin. Uh, it's good to have you guys with us, and uh, there may be more prop popping up later, or uh, if they don't watch it now live, they'll watch it later. Uh, but thanks for your encouragement. So the, the when gray disappears, so the Lord really distinctly let me know that there is a time coming where we, as the church, as the body of Christ, are returning to back where we started and where we started as the church is at Pentecost and I think it's clear to anybody that will be honest with themselves that what we've been witnessing and experiencing in the church is truly not um, what we see in recorded in the word according to Pentecost and for those uh, scoffers who say well that was for then and this is for now uh, I beg to differ uh, in fact, I believe the word bears out that some of the things that transpired there, they weren't fulfillments or completions of prophecy. They were the beginning of prophecy and, and of greater things to come. So what does gray look like and how does that fit in to where we are right now? Well, the Lord took me back to uh, when Jesus was praying for the disciples. And when he was, he prayed for the disciples, if you remember, right before uh, the, the garden, right before the prayer in the garden of Gethsemane. And I'm going to be looking at John the 17th chapter, if you want to look there, go there now, or get your Bibles later and, and follow along. But some of the things that he said in there are key. You see, many people have been living their lives based on emotions, based on feelings can't live our lives based on emotions and feelings we've got to we've got to live our lives especially as believers in a walk of faith based on the word of truth and so the prayer of jesus for the disciples same prayer for you and for me he says uh long about verse um 13 jesus is praying and he says now come i to thee and these things i speak in the world that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves i have given them thy word and the world hath hated them i'm telling you i'm coming from the verses i'm telling you we have entered a time and, and it's going to only worsen in regards to the gap between black and white 
So the gray is going to disappear as we approach the rapture, as we approach the very last of the last days for the believers here on earth. And so we are entering into a time that we are going to see the revival that we've been all talking about. We are going to see the fulfillment, I believe, of the visions and the dreams and the, and the, and the prophecies and the laying hands and the signs and the wonders and, and all of that. I believe that we are there. We are coming. This, this right here is, is setting us up. The world thinks it's setting us up for worse things to come, for more pagan and more return to uh, uh, the Roman civilization, which it is. But I'm going to tell you, God is not shocked or surprised, and none of this is going beyond him. And so he's setting us up for as believers to have a revival in our land like we've never had. So I want to answer the question, and I, I get it answered, asked a lot. What's it going to look like when this is all over? Uh, are our churches going to be full? Are they going to be empty? Are we going to have new people, et cetera, et cetera? And I believe with all of my heart that God is drawing us into an intimacy with him that we have not had. Too many have allowed the church to be their vein of worship. In other words, that's the relationship and that's as far as it goes. So again, the preacher does the praying, the preacher does the reading of the word, the study and the delivery, and all we've got to do is come and receive and say, thank you, Jesus, and, and go home. But God is wanting to mobilize his army, his body of Christ, into a way that we are one-on-one -on -one with people. We are absolutely being Jesus everywhere we go and this opportunity I believe with all of my heart that we have right now on the internet it won't always look this way either we've already had preachers that have had messages taken off don't don't worry about it God's got it but I want to go on into this when gray disappears and if you're just now joining me I see all of you there and Lord bless you thank you for being with me today I told them at the beginning I'll I'll tell you now, I'll not be in a hurry. I'll not be in a hurry. You know what that comes from. I will not be, I will not be defeated. Thank you. Will not be defeated. I heard somebody say that. All right. So let's go on. And I, I want to, I want to show you. He says that you, that you gave them to me and I want them to be one as we are one. All right. Peter is the guy that the Lord laid on my heart to share with you today about the gray. Peter was an awesome guy. He was an awesome, awesome, awesome. He's, he's the guy that a lot of people say was the rock, but really, in, in reality, he got the revelation, and the Lord said, based on this, look, that you got from God, and the gates of hell won't prevail against that. But Peter's also a guy that in this particular area before the book of Acts, before the transformation, after the resurrection, before gray disappeared in Peter's life, he was one of the ones, you remember when Jesus said to the disciples, he said, remember when I sent you out without script, without purse, without sandals, did you lack anything? And the, and the disciples said, no, we didn't lack anything. He said, well, this is different. This, uh, you're going into a time where they're going to hate you. He said, so, so if you don't have a sword, sell a garment and buy a sword. And then that's when they said, well, we've got two. And Jesus says, okay, that's enough. Then you remember when the host of army and they all come to take Jesus away, Judas is betrayed with a kiss, and they're in the garden there. The next thing you know is Simon Peter, and I'm reading, I'm, not, I'm, I'm verbatim, but I'm reading now John the, seven, uh, the uh, 18th chapter, and Simon, having a sword, drew it and smote the priest's servant and cut off his right ear and the servant's name was Malchus. Okay, so that that's our Peter in the gray. And I, I, I don't know, I love this. It doesn't say how, how Jesus healed that ear. In fact, I, I put myself there and I think, 
a lot of the, there were so many people there to arrest Jesus. It was kind of like the A-team, you know, if you ever watched the A-team and all these people were coming in and just four or five guys defeated everybody. Well, that's the way it was in reality here in the garden. So I don't think a lot of people in the back even saw what took place. But here Peter, man, he pulls out his little sword and bang, pops off Malchus's ear. And Jesus just, he just heals his ear. Now, I kind of like to think that maybe now Malchus had a new ear, his old ear, cut off ear is down on the ground somewhere. And so he grabs that sucker and he puts it, you know, he puts it under his cloak. And, and uh, I mean, can't you see him later? Man, always pulling pranks on everybody. He probably, though, changed his life. It probably changed his life. Can you imagine? Here's a guy that he's just doing what he's told. And now all of a sudden his ear gets whacked off and Jesus just reaches up there, heals his ear. And I can see, you know, taking care of that ear. I, I had some ear, though. I, I didn't bring one. But I, I can see him later saying, Honey, what would you do with my ear? And I can hear his wife saying, You've pranked people enough. Stop, you know. And, and I can hear him saying something like, uh, Now, see, this is what happens when I don't get in a hurry. I, I can hear him saying, Yeah, but I can't wait for somebody to say again, Friends, Romans, countrymen. Lend me your ears, and that's when I'm going to pull one out and go, I got another one right here. <laughs> oh, mercy. Come on, guys, laugh. It's, it's, you, you know it's got to be funny, but I, I don't know what, well, how Malchus ended up after that. Well, and because I said that, see, Julius Caesar was the guy that was assassinated, and that comes from, uh, from Shakespeare, and I think that was when, that, so that had already happened because Caesar Augustus, Julius Caesar's son was was the one that was the emperor when Jesus was born. But anyway, let's go, let's go on and talk about when gray disappears. So we know that Jesus told told Peter. He said, "You're going to deny me." He says, "Satan has desired to sift you like wheat." But I've prayed for you. We already heard the prayer. And and what was the prayer? The prayer was about the word. I have given them thy word. Here's where God wants us to be, and I'm challenging you. I'm, I'm pleading with you right now. Utilize this time. I've seen some of you. Joanna, I saw, I saw a, a post that you put, and, and how that they're on your, on your counter. You was having time, and I, I'm sorry to single anybody out, but you, I, it just come to my mind, and you're having time in the Word. This is a time for you to get alone with God, have communion with the Father, have an intimate time with God, quit relying on the church, Quit relying on the pastor to do all the digging. Can I tell you, I could be in the Word, I could be in the Word more than I could be in anywhere else because there's so much here. And he is in, it's a season right now, he is in a revelation time. He is revealing more than you can imagine. Every time I open the Word, he's revealing. So when gray disappears, let me show you a little bit more gray Jesus said, Peter, you're going to die, deny me three times. And before, and, and that's, that's going to happen even before the rooster crows. Sure enough, we see him still here in, in, in uh, John 18. Uh, just a servant girl sees Peter following Jesus afar off after he's been taken into the court to be flogged. And, and she says, aren't, aren't you one of that man's disciples? And he says, I am not. Then a little bit later, around verse... Uh, 25, Simon Peter stood and warmed himself by the fire, and they said, therefore unto him, Art not thou also one of his disciples? He denied it, and he said, I am not. And one of the servants of the high priest, being his kinsman, whose ear Peter cut off, remember? We just talked about it. So Malchus has a cousin. Small world, always you're looking around going, wow. Well, it's a small world for Peter, and it's closing in really quick. And all of a sudden, he's got somebody, a kinfolk to Malchus. He's already seen Malchus's ear. He probably definitely knew about Malchus's ear. And he says, hey, aren't you also one of the disciples? And Peter says, I am not. And then that was the third time, and we know that immediately the cock crew. But let me show you the difference. That's Peter then. We also, we talked about Peter after the tomb was empty and how that John outran him and then he, he runs and he stoops in and he sees the linen cloth, the napkin laying on the, and, 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 and the, the, the grave clothes, he sees all that. And we see how that he, he takes off and, and let, me, let me show you what happens over in the book of Acts. 
because this is a different guy. They've waited 50 days, just like Jesus told them, in Jerusalem, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. Oh, man. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it set upon each one of them. And they were all, all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. You can't tell me that was for then and it's not for now. I'm telling you, if you're believing that, you're missing out on the greater promises that God has put out there for all of us. Well, I just don't feel comfortable, uh, you know, speaking into other tongues. Well, get over yourself. Get over yourself, get out of yourself, get away from yourself, and let God take over. And I want to tell you, when you let that tongue, uh, 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 there, that tongue is a mighty member. It's the mightiest member of our whole body. That's why we have all that's going on with fake book. I mean, Facebook. What's going on with face, Facebook is a bunch of people, you know, we can, we get real bold and we can say anything or we, we get real spiritual and we can say anything. Look, God's calling us to a real place, a genuine place between us and between him so that no matter what happens in this world, because all that's going is it's returning back to its roots as we return back to ours at the same time. And I'm telling you, the gray is disappearing and it's going to become black or white. Now let me read on. He said, and they gave, they spoke in tongues as a spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of nation, out of every nation under heaven. Now imagine that. Imagine how that got set up. Okay? So out of every nation there were uh, under the heaven, there were people there gathered. And now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. Can I tell you, when this, all of this is over, it don't matter whether we have internet, it don't matter what we have. I'm going to tell you, when the glory cloud is resting upon my life and your life, when the glory cloud is resting upon the body of believers, and when the Holy Ghost and power is moving and motivating us, and no longer are we worried about pleasing one another, no longer are we worried about what the color of the carpet is, or how cold or warm it is, or what songs we sing, I want to tell you, when we get to that place, that's when God is moving among us. We stop bickering about this and that. We stop wondering if we're going to have three songs or six songs. We, we don't worry about if we're repeating songs or not repeating songs. I want to tell you that when we get to that point, and I know I'm preaching now, but I can't help myself. When we get to that point, we are going to know that God is real in our lives, and we won't have to worry about promoting ourselves or promoting the church or getting other people people to come in because they're going to see and hear, they're going to feel, and they're going to experience, and then they're going to get the word in them. Two of the words that God had continually, continually said to me, and I want to say thank you all for joining me. I see you there, and I, oh, I thank God for you. Repair and prepare. Repair, prepare. Over the last 18 months, the Lord has been Reiterating those two words, repair and prepare. You see, in my life, I had a lot of things that I needed to be have repaired. You're not the only one that's been hurt by church. You're not the only one that's uh, that that has has been been offended. You're not the only one that's had a hard time. You're not the only one. And so God has been wanting to repair, and I can speak for myself, he wanted to repair me. Repairing me meant me spending time with him, spending intimate time with him, getting to know him, not trying to prove him to my mind, but trying to get into 
his mind so that my mind becomes his mind. Let this mind be in you. That's the mind that I've been calling for and asking for with favor and wisdom, with grace and with mercy and saying, God, what do you want? And so that repairing of my heart, repairing of my mind, because see, Romans uh, Romans 12 talks about transforming our mind. He says that's where we've got to that's where the work has to happen. Our minds are so messed up. We may have a heart after God that says, man, I, I want to make heaven my home. I've got a good heart. But listen, until your mind is being transformed according to the word, you're going to have struggle after struggle after struggle. Your mind and my mind has to line up with God's word. And so when this gray disappears, I want to show you all of these people from all the nations that I'm reading in Acts 2, they heard all of these people speaking in their own native language. <laughs> and it says, verse 12, And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mocking said, Oh, and here's where we're going to get that, that gray disappearing to Peter. Others mocking these said, said, These men are f full of new wine. They're full of new wine. Now remember, all it took was a little damsel girl, nothing against her, but a servant girl to get get into Peter's Wheaties. And I mean, Peter's denying, cussing, and going, oh, I don't know, Jesus. Well, look what happens here when gray disappears and white takes over. Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all that ye dwell at Jerusalem, be known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Now I want you to hear me. This prophecy spoken by the prophet Joel was not completed and fulfilled in its entirety in the book of Acts. It began there and it will culminate to a high finish this side of the rapture. Mark my words and it shall come to pass in the last days. They thought they were in the last days. The last days. We're in the last days. This is a time when we don't need to be worried. Can I tell you, let, let me just get real with you. And again, thank you all for watching right now. Here's what's transpired as I see it in the church. In our church world, if you have a pastor that's getting a salary, that pastor that's getting a salary most likely is ministering and pastoring a group of people that are predominantly mature in age. They are most likely my age, the gray. I started to do when gray disappears and get me some men stuff and blacken it, but I, I decided not to do that. But here's what happens. When that pastor is getting a salary and he's getting that salary, no matter how good of a man he is, myself included, that salary is kind of like handcuffs binding him to a set of perimeters, to a set of traditions, to a set of beliefs, if you would, that's based on, well, that's the way we've always done it that's the way it's always been and it worked it was good enough for our grandma it was good enough for them it's got to be good enough for me please understand my heart today as I'm crying out to you with a transparency of this when gray disappears that God laid on my heart so what happens is that pastor or these pastors get bound, whether they want to or not, in following after that tradition because, guess what? 
the majority of the adult, mature people in our churches in America today, they're the ones that are tithing. They're the ones that are giving. They're the ones that are paying the bills. So guess what? Pastors are going, I need to keep them happy. And if you're in that category, I'm not saying that all of us are bad, but what I'm saying is it is keeping us bound in a way that God is wanting to loose us and let us go. If we were truly unleashed right now, and at a place where Paul was a tent maker, and he made his own tents, and there was times he went to places, and he didn't require anything of them, he paid his own way. That's why he says, if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. And so if we get these pastors across, these good shepherds across our land to a place where they can totally follow God, regardless if it feels good, if regardless if it goes along with our traditions, regardless of what it looks like or feels like, but it's according to based on God's word, I want to tell you, we will have revival. It will be a revival that God sends and God empowers, and that's really where we're headed right now. I believe we're coming into a time where all the things that we've had at our disposal are not going to be so easily accessible. And it's going to require us, me as a pastor, all of you to follow after God. And so I want to, I want to show you that he says, after Peter stands up, he says, and he says this, I'm still quoting the prophecy of Joel, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. I'm dreaming dreams. I've, I've gone from the vision to the dreams, and so I guess I'm old, but that's all right. And all my servants and my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned in darkness and the moon into blood. Have you seen that already? I have. Before that great and notable day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord, shall be saved. We'll go from an entertainment at church. We'll go from all the smoke in the mirrors. We'll go from a, of a time of, well, I've always done it this way, and if you do it any different way, I'm going to be mad. We're going to go to a time where when we gather is God's business. Where we gather is God's business. I'm telling you, we're coming into a time when there's going to be more intimate gatherings, more smaller groups get groups gathered, and we are going to really begin to deliver the word of God as it is. So let me let me let me let me go to one last scripture. And if you're just joining me, <coughs> excuse me. I said I wouldn't be in a hurry, and I'm not, but I do want to go to Romans, the 12th chapter, and just read. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, therefore, brethren, therefore, is always there for a reason, and the therefore in this reason was because right before Romans 12 and Romans 11, Paul has been talking about the covenant with God and Israel, and then how that the Gentiles have been brought into the better promises of God. So because of that, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, or your spiritual service. And be not conformed to this world. When gray disappears, there is going to be a distinction. When you go into a dark room and you turn on a light, is there not a huge difference? All of a sudden, and, and it's not that you understand, darkness is just the absence of light. When you flip on the, the switch, darkness disappears. That's where God's calling 
the body of Christ, the church, in these last days. And so you individually, I want to, I, I want to, I want to plead to you today to be not conformed to this world. Don't look like the world. Don't act like the world. Jesus, I don't think he was a politically correct guy. He did things that ruffled the feathers of the Roman Empire, of the Pharisees, of the religious people. I do stuff all the time that, that just gets in the crawl of people that are real religious because I tell people I'm one of the few I'm one of the least religious people you'll ever meet. And what I mean by that is I don't have the traditions and the things that, that set you up and, and make you that I, I'm done with the works plan. I'm back to the heart and the transformation of my mind to get me in line with his word. So he says, Be not conformed to this world. But be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. He doesn't transform us by the renewing of our emotions. Well, I don't feel saved. Well, so what? If God says that you are, then you are. He says by the renewing of our mind. And how do we renew our mind? Go back to the prayer Jesus prayed for the disciples right before they went to the garden. He prayed that he had given them the word. The word is what transforms us. He says, so that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What is the perfect and will perfect will of God? That we be transformed back into his image. That we stop living a life that we were never ever meant to live. All the people that are living in sin and living in hypocrisy, they're living a life that God never intended them to live. I enjoy living the life that God is intending me to live. And the more I get in his word and the more his word transforms me, the more obedient I become, then the more I understand where he wants me. So he goes on and he says, and I'll close with this, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I said I was going to close with that. Brother Sean, bless your heart. You reminded me that I say that a lot. Here's what he says in Romans the 8th chapter. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. There is there now no more condemnation. Do you all remember what Jesus did on Good Friday? And remember what he did just yesterday as ascending to the Father for a moment before he came back and told him to wait and go to Pentecost? That was all to say, it's finished. It's already taken care of. Get your mind into alignment with his. And he says, there's no condemnation to them which walk. If, if somebody's condemning you, they're, they're speaking louder than God's word is. If you're the one that's condemning yourself, you're putting yourself in the place of God. God's not condemning you. That's not God. God is a God of love, of truth, of faithfulness. And I'm going to tell you how the Holy Ghost works. Holy Ghost is a gentleman. And, and I, I, I don't hardly ever, I, he just doesn't come and just slap me upside the head with a 50-pound Schofield Bible. Well, what he does is he genuinely nudges me. And he urges me. And he prompts me. As I get closer into my intimate time with him, I start knowing that's him. And I want to tell you, God wants us to be at a place where it's no longer, Lord, is that you? When gray disappears, it starts being, oh, I, I don't think that was me. I know that was you. I know that was you, Lord. And so this is the step that I'm going to take. What the law could not do in that it was weak, through the flesh, God sent in his own Son in likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. And he goes on and he talks about to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. The mind of Christ. 
When we get the mind of Christ, I want to tell you, church, we are going to operate as the body of Christ really should operate. So it's time to get excited about what's going on and not be defeated. It's time to be at peace with what God's doing in the work of the church because he is shaking everything that can be shaken. And so if you got stuff in your life that's being shaken, let it shake and let it fall off because what he wants to do is bring on a new you that is in more in line with him than it has ever been and than you have ever been in your life. You will stop thinking about the things about, ooh, I wonder what will happen to here. I wonder what about that. You'll stop thinking about any of that and you'll just start being in tune with him and saying, Lord, I'm ready for whatever you have next. And I'm going to tell you, whatever ne is next, it's good. When gray disappears is when the church gets back to its original design, back to where we started. And I'm going to tell you, light always wins because it changes everything. God bless every one of you.